I want to start by telling you a story. In 2001, a paper that had the chance to immediately revolutionize public health in communities around the world was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, one of the leading scientific journals. This paper reported results from the first ever clinical trial for a vaccine against typhoid for children. Typhoid is a brutal disease that's a serious problem in low and middle income countries. It's caused by the salmonella bacteria and results in high fevers, headaches, and diarrhea. And the results from this study were thrilling. This vaccine was wildly effective in preventing children from getting sick. What mattered though, was not how impactful those results could have been, but rather what actually happened to them. To answer that question, let's fast forward to 2016, 15 years later, when despite there being an effective vaccine, typhoid was still raging. Doctors in Southeast Pakistan and Northwest India were noticing a sudden uptick in patients with the disease. And patients were dying, not because they weren't getting treatment. In fact, doctors were using treatments that they had always used, drugs that had always worked, but their patients weren't getting any better. The bacteria that were causing this outbreak were what's known as extensively drug resistant, meaning that they are untreatable by most antibiotics, drugs that usually cure bacterial infections. And fighting extensively drug resistant bacteria with common antibiotics to which they don't respond it's like trying to tear down a stone castle and all you have is a plastic fork. Desperate to find something that could help remedy this outbreak, doctors decided to push the envelope and try that typhoid vaccine I mentioned earlier for the first time in the real world. It had a big impact. Cases and deaths decreased and vaccinated children were 95% less likely to get sick. And mothers, who often leave their jobs behind to care for sick children, shared that their mental health was better. And children in these communities who suffer from diarrhea after getting typhoid are often stigmatized, but vaccinating and preventing the disease lessened these injustices. So why did it take 15 years and a crisis between those results saying that the typhoid vaccine could save lives and the actual implementation of that vaccine to save lives. This is the biggest question facing us researchers today. How do we ensure that our science serves society? I recently had my first couple of research papers published and found myself asking exactly this question. How do I, as a scientist, make my results positively impact communities? And I was fortunate to dive into some work where we had to do just this. Let me share with you that story. And along the way, my three point plan for how we can all ensure that the knowledge we generate serves society. First, questioning. There aren't easy or obvious solutions to many of the problems we attack. Climate change, discrimination, accessibility, these are all insanely tough issues. They require us to attack fundamental yet critical problems to question our assumptions as we investigate what may seem obvious, just like those doctors did to fight that typhoid outbreak. When the COVID-19 pandemic first hit, the immediate response from the public health world was to lock down and improve cleanliness. These are the strategies that are generally applied to most any infectious disease outbreak, but locking down is a luxury and telling communities and hospitals that were overburdened by trying to save people's lives that they also needed to improve cleanliness? Well, that's practically impossible without the resources and time necessary to help those efforts. So we had to look beyond the obvious to find effective and cheap alternatives to keep people healthy. We knew there were tests for COVID, but historically, such tests had been reserved for hospital doctors to confirm what they were treating. We wondered, though, whether these tests, either the common RT-PCR or less sensitive and therefore cheaper rapid antigen, could actually instead be used to actively identify new infections and limit the spread of disease. Now, this probably seems like a perfectly reasonable idea. 
After all, this is the leading way to deal with a COVID outbreak now. But back in 2020, when we all thought this would be over in just a few months, when scientists first thought about this idea, we had to fundamentally question the assumption that testing should only be reserved to be a confirmatory tool and couldn't be used to catch and limit spread in real time. So we took to our computers and math and simulated a pretend population based on your office building or local school and modeled the spread of COVID in that fake population. We simulated testing so we could identify an infection and then place that infectious person in isolation so they wouldn't transmit anymore. And as we dove deep into the modeling and the assumptions, we discovered many ways where tests could be used to reduce COVID cases and spread, something that had never been shown before. And by questioning that assumption that testing should remain as a confirmatory tool, we stumbled across something even more exciting and unexpected. We found surprisingly that the less sensitive and cheaper rapid antigen tests could be more effective in reducing cases than the more sensitive RT-PCR tests if the antigen tests were used frequently and widely. It was pretty cool to see it all come together. And for me, this is the first part of using science in service of society. We have to explore the limits of what's possible to dig beyond what is accepted wisdom. That's what we did here when we thought about testing as a containment tool and that cheaper could actually be better. Tough problems often require counterintuitive ideas, challenge your thinking. As we began to question the narrative, it was awesome how new and impactful results emerged. I don't think you can ever know what will come from exploring the unexplored. There is a catch though, a catch that brings me to my second point about using science in service of society, and that's contextualizing. When we modeled applying the same testing strategies to different countries, say the US and India, with different cultures and societal norms, we got wildly different results. Strategies that we simulated as reducing deaths the most in the US didn't do the same in India. For many years in global health, there's been an emphasis on taking solutions that worked well in one place and just applying them as is to other locations. If they've been successful somewhere, shouldn't they be successful elsewhere? This, however, completely neglects cultural differences that can be so important to not only how a disease spreads, but the best way to contain it as well. That's my second point about using science in service of society. Know your context. And in this case, that meant we had to dig deeper to figure out why there may be such a big difference in disease spread between the US and India. And the answer turned out to be fascinating. When we think about the difference in health between the US and India, we often think about healthcare access or the burden of disease. But we found that something else was actually the main driver in why a testing strategy succeeded or failed. And that was social connectivity. In the US, people tend to interact more in generational clusters. School children interact with other school children and people at work interact with those in their office. In India, there's that. But there's also a lot of contact between generations because of multi-generational households. Young children interact more with their grandparents. And this difference ended up driving huge changes in how the disease spreads. In the US, as long as you tested people frequently, you could cut down cases and deaths. But in India, you needed to be testing enough people first before increasing the frequency really became helpful. So, Know your context. Now, hopefully I've explained this in a way that seems natural. Context should matter. And I know many of us know this, but there's unfortunately a gap in thinking that and using those insights to create community specific and tailored solutions. As I saw here, our results only made sense once we contextualized them. Medical ideas like testing and disease spread were overshadowed by differences in cultural and social factors. Solutions have to start with the context. It's not something that can just be added later. And the truth is that local contexts can make or break the science. Before moving to my third point, I want to talk about how questioning 
and contextualizing have to go hand in hand. And that only happens when strategies aren't imposed on a community, but rather developed from the inside out, working with the community. But what does that actually mean in practice? Let's talk about the 2020 Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games. Originally scheduled for summer 2020, just months after the COVID-19 pandemic first hit, the games were delayed till summer 2021 under the hopes that there would be less disease spread. As we all know, that was not the case. And here was a wickedly tough problem. What did the modeling suggest was a good way to allow the Olympic and Paralympic Games to happen while ensuring athletes didn't get sick, the local Japanese didn't get sick, and athletes didn't bring the virus back with them when they went home. The conventional wisdom was that all athletes should be vaccinated, get to Japan two weeks early, quarantine, wear their masks continuously, and minimize any physical contact throughout the games. Imagine telling that to the boxing team. Don't get near your opponent. That's not boxing. Not to mention imposing a quarantine on all athletes after arriving in Japan was an economic burden at a time when local economies were already so strained. So time to put idea one into action, question our assumptions and go for the moonshot. We questioned the assumption that testing could only look backwards to catch already existing infections. The modeling suggested a strategy that used testing and contact tracing to identify athletes who were the most likely to get sick, and then they were tested so frequently that infections were practically predicted and caught in real time before any serious spread was possible. Our simulation showed that cases would likely stay low and an outbreak was improbable. There is, like before, a bit of a catch. This was all theoretical modeling. We had no clue how the Olympic and Paralympic games were actually going to play out. These were the first pandemic games, probably not something the ancient Greeks envisioned when they had their first Olympics. We couldn't predict how athletes were going to interact with each other or what the local Japanese situation would be like during the games. But we ventured a guess, tried everything, and did it starting with the local context. Without it, our results were meaningless. And that idea of how we had no clue how the games were actually going to pan out, but had to trust the local Japanese population brings me to my third point about using science in service of society. Trust, mutual trust. Using our knowledge in service of society requires that we work with communities, not on communities, so that we can together create solutions from the inside out. It requires that you don't disentangle the one problem that you think you're working on from the rest of that community. And it requires that we act in a way that allows us to be trusted. When I try to serve society, I'm invited into a community where it's my job to learn about their customs. And then hopefully I am entrusted with working on something helpful. We trust each other. Together, we create solutions that are integrated into communities that are empowering. Today, I'm thinking about trying to predict those problems of tomorrow to be one step ahead so that I can start now to work with unfairly marginalized communities on solutions that can prevent the wicked problems that are thrown at them, like how climate change is creating new infectious diseases that we're unprepared for, or how drug resistance is exacerbating already existing barriers and accessibility to treatments. These are the ideas and problems that consume me. I think about them all the time, at the dinner table, on hikes, in the car. And the solutions I dream up don't work most of the time. It's easy to get lost in the details of the science. The science does get convoluted and difficult, but why I do it is not. If there's anything I want you to remember from this talk, it's that. Know why you do what you do. Have clarity in your intentionality. When I know why I do what I do, it's exciting, it's thrilling. I am on a quest to develop the greatest tools and methods, whatever they may be, to attack tomorrow's problem. But it doesn't end there. 
I want to be actively involved in working on cutting edge ideas and practically involved in working with communities to develop solutions that emerge from the inside out. Maybe you are a scientist, maybe you're not. Regardless, I invite you to join me in questioning, contextualizing, and trusting so that we can together make our work serve society. Thank you.